Hello, and welcome to our exciting roundtable on virtual money, reshaping post-pandemic payment technologies. Um, we have a great lineup of illustrious panelists. I'm not going to take time to introduce them all now so we can maximize our time for discussion. Um, but if you'd like to know more about them, please visit the speaker bios on the forum portal. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, you know, it, it's become a, a widely quoted uh, figure that COVID-19 has accelerated the adoption of e-commerce and digital payments by three to five years. Right? We've seen contact solutions, mobile banking apps, um, a growing number of new ways to pay, like digital wallets, QR codes, buy now, pay later. Um, we've seen all these things really proliferate. Um, so let me ask you all, how has your organization changed its approach to payments in the commercial sector and for consumers during the pandemic? Let's start with Jeremy. Thanks, Julie, Re really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it was re really remarkable just looking back over the, over the last 15 months and seeing this. So, um, you know, Circle for, for, for people's background, we operate something called USDC, which is a dollar digital currency. And it is a payment technology that works on on the public internet on, on blockchains and going back to really the inception of the pandemic like february march we literally saw this incredible transformation that happened right as the lockdown started happening in in asia and the us and europe and, and other places and so just for perspective um in march of of last year there was something like 400 million USDC in circulation, which was, you know, a a a good number, is a significant number, and um, and now we're about 50x that size uh, since since that period of time, and so the amount of dollar digital currency that's gone into circulation has just exploded. Um, in the aggregate, the amount of dollar digital currencies in circulation is over 100 billion now. USDC itself. Has grown to 25 billion um, USDC uh, digital currency units in circulation, um, and and even just since January of this year, where we started January 1st with 4 billion in circulation, now at 25, just it continues to grow. What's interesting is that this, this is happening globally. We're seeing demand from all around the world for people who want to transact in a digital currency to be able to safely, affordably, and easily move money around the internet, similar to how they can share data and communicate. And then just in terms of volumes, um, you know, we've over the last 12 months, um, we've seen almost $700 billion in on blockchain transactions using USDC. So the transaction volumes have also exploded. And so that like literally had correlated to the inception of the pandemic. And, and then I think it is part of this broader kind of leapfrogging of moving from legacy uh, technologies or legacy business models into more natively digital uh, business models. Martha, what's your perspective uh, in the Philippines? Okay, so the Philippines has one of the longest lockdown periods in the world. So, and due to the quarantine restrictions, we've seen really a huge shift to online behavior in almost all aspects of our daily lives. And uh, what we've been doing is practically just following the consumer's uh, behavior, um, whether it's building virtual communities. We we find like merchants now in, in Viber, in Instagram, in Facebook Marketplace, all those stuff. And um, good thing that when the world closed down on them, on, on their uh, physical stores, uh, they found a, um, an instrument in, in Gcash in a way to, to receive and send money um, in a cashless and safe way. Um, we've also seen um, the non-contact revolution that has led people to go to e-commerce for their essentials. So uh, people are buying groceries, utilities, and Gcash provided a safe and easy and secure mode of payments. So um, we, we've seen exponential growth, not just in subscriber base, but also in merchants uh, that we are enabling. So we, before we only had like 75,000 merchants uh, before the pandemic. Now we have more than 2.2 million merchants and social sellers uh, using our QR and P2P platform. Um, our subscriber base back in January 2020 was around 20 million uh, subscribers. Now we're at 40 million, comprising 40% of the uh, population. So really exponential growth um, and even the types of services that we offer actually are um, have expanded um, um, from from before simple send money just showing your numbers using the mobile numbers but we've expanded to 
QR, P2P. Um, we've also done mini app, uh, which is normally just same in, in WeChat or in um, and financial products, but now we, we have it in, in Gcash through GLife where we house various apps. Um, and what's interesting is th this allows uh, people in, in the Philippines who have smartphone, by the way, smartphone penetration in the Philippines is high, but um, the, the challenge is the phone book memory. It, it, it's the phone memory. And therefore people are challenged to prioritize the app that they download. So this solution allows them to um, uh, don't have to prioritize the apps that they download because everything's inside the Gcash app now. So that's how we've evolved. Um, also, we've expanded into financial services. We recently launched Global Funds, um, which was unheard of before um, among the mass. Um, it, it used to be just for the rich to, to be able to invest in funds and you needed millions of pesos just to get to that. Um, but now for as low as a, a dollar for local funds and 20 dollars for global funds you can invest uh, and so like our advertising is around okay rather than buying a, a starbucks you can put put your money and invest your money in global funds right so uh, those types and we, we've expanded also into um, credit um, even insurance that's um, um, less than a dollar so for less than a dollar you get a, an insurance for covid and dengue which are like prevalent sicknesses in in the philippines right now um so uh, that it, it has um, um, uh, allowed us to innovate, um, but again, always following the customer and customers as, as our North Star. Um, and I ha we have Jeremy and Ran here, and we're also probably in the future looking at crypto, uh, even global trading and, and local trading as well. Okay, so really tremendous growth um, in users of digital wallets, and that goes to the, the smartphone penetration, um, and it goes to what the pandemic, I guess, really drove people um, to, to move online and look to digitization. Um, let's get the perspective um, from DAX, um, from the, the big bank perspective with HSBC. It is so exciting with HSBC. Um, we always talk about opening up a world of opportunity, and that is exactly why we're here. We're so focused on our clients and our customers and really listen to, to what they need and require. And we're always focused on digitization. So making sure that we have a seamless experience. There's always more to do. And, that, and that's the good thing about the job in order to to enable our customers to live their day-to-day -day lives. We are very focused not only on our payment technologies, but digitizing those simply. Um, so we become an enabler to everybody um, wanting to um, achieve their goals in life. And we really support that, whether they are a personal customer or a business customer or a client. And the beauty of HSBC is that we are global. So we are able to connect all of those things. I am personally very deeply grateful for um, the ethos within HSBC and how we appreciate this with our values. And we are also very focused on our global le leadership and making sure that um, we do what we can for the environment, our net zero policy, um, all of those good things. And looking at, you know, the simple view of payments and how, you know, you look at a more cashless society, um, actually by minimizing the mobilization of cash, we can also reduce emissions globally. So not only are we driving payments and enabling day-to-day -day lives, we are actually um, working on some very key initiatives to make sure that we um, action global good. The, the other thing about this, and I always um, bring payments akin to um, communications. If you take your phone, for example, there are so many ways to communicate these days. It's often how do you simplify that? And equally with payments, there are so many different ways to make a payment. It's really how you make life simple for the customer and the client. So there's some really exciting um, opportunities within HSBC. And, and the good thing about um, this is that not only we do we learn from our local expertise, so uh, be uh, global and be local, um, but also we have the power and the leverage to um, impact um, the global economy as well. Let's go from that global perspective and we'll, we'll come back uh, to more of some of those things you touched on, Dax. Um, let's move to, to South Africa um, and hear from Jan on what he's working on there. Good afternoon. Yes, so um, I uh, I am working for the largest clearing house in Africa, and I will probably bring a slightly different perspective, because just to give you a sense, uh, in South Africa today, nine out of ten payments are in cash. Even though many people have bank accounts, uh, they basically transact in cash. 
the the issue uh, is that also South Africa was probably one of the countries with the harshest uh, lockdown at the beginning, and that brought significant economic uh, hardship on people. People couldn't, you know, they lost jobs because most people are working in informal economies and they couldn't feed their families. So the government had to, together with the banking sector and other uh, payments ecosystem providers, they had to find a way how to distribute, uh, they call it COVID, uh, COVID social grants to millions of people in South Africa. And it was about distributing around 25 US dollars a month. Uh, which is a significant amount, money, a significant amount of money for people who really struggle to put food on the table. So um, we realized that it's not easy in a cash-driven economy. And uh, by the way, the lockdown actually caused our digital transaction to go down to 20 or 30 percent of uh, what we were seeing in the normal days. So for us uh, in South Africa, most of people started actually reverting to cash. The good news here is uh, never waste a, a serious crisis or bad experience. So what we now realized across the industry, including government, is that uh, we need to change the culture. We need to change how people believe, how they transact with financial services. And one of the other aspects is uh, in Africa, many people, they don't have any documents, they don't have birth certificates. So having proper digital identity where people can verify their claims and government can assess if they can pay these people or those people, all of that is now coming together. And I feel we are gaining a lot of momentum to change and really move more into the digital space. So. Great. And and one um, one company that touches many of what we just, many of the aspects of what we just heard and the types of companies from the, that we just heard from is Visa. Um, so let me turn to Salvador um, to get a, a look at how Visa is seeing all these changes. Thank you, Julie. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you to the Qatar Economic Forum for the invitation. From For, for Visa, as you can imagine, uh, we have been very active supporting uh, both our clients to make sure they would have the infrastructure ready and uh, separately ensure that uh, consumers and merchants, buyers and sellers really have the right technology and the tools to deal with the pandemic. I would like to emphasize probably just three trends that we have seen across the globe, but I will make some comments based on the region where I'm based. Um, I'm based in, in Dubai. And I would say the first big trend that we saw was the adoption of contactless across the globe. And the contactless infrastructure is key, not only for, for cards, but really for digital wallets for all the pays that are coming on board, whether it's Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Google Pay, you name it. That's an infrastructure that has grown significantly across the globe. But I would say right now, countries like Russia, the GCC countries have close to 90% of contactless adoption. In Saudi Arabia, 30% of the transactions at the point of sale are already involving a mobile device. That was a trend that we had seen before, but it has drastically accelerated as a result of the pandemic. There's increased interest from consumers on knowing how to, to use the technology. And obviously all the, the merchants need to have that infrastructure in place. The second uh, trend obviously is e-commerce. We saw debit cards that had never transacted started starting to, 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 to transact with e-commerce consumers that have never done a transaction before doing it. We saw triple digit growth, even in, 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 in Sub-Saharan Africa with all the um, food deliveries. So even though during the pandemic, the, the physical transactions were decreasing or dropping, still growing very significantly, as I said, triple digit growth. And the third component has to go with uh, P2P, person-to-person, uh, -person, and moving funds in general, whether it's domestic or internationally. That's also the fast, one of the fastest growing channels that we have. There's uh, also an interest at a global policy level to continue providing better and uh, less expensive solutions to move funds. And, and that's uh, another area where we're investing uh, with many partners to ensure we have these capabilities fully deployed. Great, some interesting stats there. Thanks, Salvador. I want to turn um, to uh, to Goldie. Um, several of you have mentioned uh, crypto and expanding to explore crypto, um, and um, uh, and Goldie is right right up his alley um, with First Digital. Um, Goldie, what are you seeing? 
coming out of the pandemic. Thanks, Julie. Uh, and thanks again for the invitation to be here. So I, I think you, you've, everyone talked exactly spot on. I mean, in the past 18 months, if, if 18 months ago we would talk to merchants and acquirers and PSPs gateways and we would tell them, how about you start accepting stable coins and other digital currencies, they would look at us as we're holding something radioactive and they would say, please leave the building. Uh, we, we don't want to touch this. But today, 18 months after, you, you can see all of the big techs uh, out there are trying to make their first steps. And some are actually very far advanced in this. Uh, and, and again, Salvador from Visa, we have Visa and MasterCard declaring that they want to be the rails of, of money, not just payment by plastic, but they want to be the rails for money transfers for you for peer to peer to want to be uh, associated with stable coins and cryptocurrencies and everything. We see PayPal uh, making their first moves in the last six months. So what we've been witnessing, I think, is first of all, obviously, merchants are asking for more uh, solutions that are not cash based and stable coins uh, are part of that for e commerce more than anything else. Uh, but also we've been seeing big tech moving into that direction, right? With, again, Visa backing Circle, probably one of the largest and, and best companies in the space today. Uh, MasterCard also backing another crypto company called Consensus. Uh, and, and I think we're going to see a lot of interesting things coming next in that space. Definitely, definitely. You know, one of the things that, that I think each of you have touched, have touched on is the movement away from cash. Um, the numbers that we have, cash usage globally, is still around 30%. It's been coming down maybe one to two points a year. Clearly, it's, it's beginning to deteriorate even faster now as digital payments are accelerating. Um, so the question is, you know, what are you seeing as cash is beginning to come up, become obsolete? One, are these changes that we're talking about here, here to stay, right? And then um, two, what, is that, what does that mean for the broader economies. You need to think about the unbanked, right? Um, the small businesses who are very light when it comes to banking services and options. Um, so how, how is this decline away from cash um, beginning to change all those things? What are the adjustments that have to be made? Um, Jeremy, do you wanna start with that one? Sure, I, I, I'm happy to. I mean, I, I think there's, um, there's sort of like, Cash is a product, right? It's a product of central banks, and it's a product that 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 people like. Um, and there's it, there's features of the product. It, it's private. Uh, it is a bearer instrument that you can hold and possess, and it has settlement finality. Um, so there's it's an extraordinary invention, if you will, and and it's 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 really important. Um, I think um, the move to digital payments. Um, on the one hand, you can look at it as, wow, this is more efficient, and we don't have all of the, you know, the 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 excesses, if you will, from from traditional notes and coins in circulation. But I think the the flip side is is that you know people value um, the ability to have you know final settlement and and the capabilities of of what cash exists as a product. And so I think what we're seeing happen in the world today is this incredible demand. For digital currencies, um, digital currencies are growing at an extraordinary rate, and the digital currencies are demanded by individuals that want to preserve some of those features of cash. Um, and there's, it, it's an interesting thing because you get the combination of, uh, you know, effectively, you know, highly efficient payment and settlement. In, in fact, you know, the promise of digital currency, of course, is that you can settle a payment transaction at the speed of the internet. At a fraction of a cent, uh, and and do that without a, a payment network taking a fee or a traditional acquirer taking a fee, and so moving towards ubiquitous, interoperable, um, you know, effectively free value exchange. But you can preserve some of the things that I think people really care about um, in terms of privacy preservation um, and security. Um, and and so when we look forward, is what, what's the future of not just electronic money and digital payments, what's the future of currency, what's the future of base government money uh, versus private sector, privately issued forms of, of digital currency. These are all topics that are kind of swirling together as we evaluate that. And I think 
um, for for many of us, and, and I include myself in this, um, it's actually hard to even see what might be the case, say, five years from now. Um, and the, the, the technology developments are so profound. Um, blockchain technology, the, ab the ability to have money that can be programmed, financial contracts that can be programmed on the open internet, that is just such a huge breakthrough that most um, you know, firms, corporations, financial institutions have not even begun to consider. Um, and, and so, you know, I guess my view is um, cash will shift to digital currency and digital currency will grow and proliferate pretty massively as it already is into trillions and trillions of dollars of value. But the answer can't just be, let's jam this into closed loop, private controlled, uh, you know, centrally administered systems. We, we, we really do need to think about how we embrace what the open internet is, is bringing to all of this. Cool, do you, why don't you follow on to that with, with your view on digital currencies and replacing cash and what that might mean for the economy, the unbanked, the underbanked? Well, I think that's probably the largest opportunity that you know the companies that we've talked before are, are seeing is that e-wallets are literally replacing cash. And, and again, Gcash is one of the best examples for this. But worldwide, we're seeing companies driving more and more users towards their e-wallets because they understand that wallets are the future of bank accounts. Because if, if 40 million people are using Gcash today, then maybe a year or two years from now, they wouldn't even want to have a bank account because those wallets are replacing their need to have a bank and to get cash out of their ATM. And they can just use e-wallets to make contactless payments, peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And I think that what we're, see what we're witnessing today is this transition period because governments also understand that cash is, is the past and they need to move forward with, you know, with digitization and they need to create digital currencies. And by the time they do that, and I hope it's going to be in the next five to 10 years uh, and, and most countries, but by the time they do that, I think we're gonna see a lot of e-wallets out there like uh, Marta's, e, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Gcash or Circle with, with their products. And I think those companies are gonna be the big winners of, uh, of our time. And by the time the governments get the, that digital currency out, uh, those companies will might even become the new banks if banks won't wake up. Such an interesting point um, as far as the digital wallets um, and all that they're doing to really expand banking services. So let's let's turn to Martha uh, to hear what Gcash is doing more and how that's really proliferating this move away from from cash. Um, and then I want to turn to Dax and hear how HSBC is uh, is defending its territory. Uh, Martha, do you want to start? Sure. So. You know, what, what we're seeing in terms of statistics is that our wallet is used at least twice a day by active users. So imagine now, um, whereas before, like when you go to a bank, you'd, you'd like go there like once a year, twice a year, or once a quarter. But now, I mean, with the digital wallets, they use it twice a day. And that that's um, that's not the logins yet, right? Uh, so what, what it encourages actually is the velocity uh, of the of the movement of the money and the diversification of 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 the use of cash, right? So uh, because everything's just a tap away, um, it accelerates even financial literacy in the Philippines, where uh, bank penetration is very low at thirty five percent. You have the you have a large part which is unbanked. Not to mention that within that thirty five percent, there are what we call underbanked, those who just use um, their bank accounts for savings and just keep it there or for payroll, just keep it there. But now there people we see people more actively involved in decision making and in managing their finances. Um, it's so heartwarming to see that uh, we now have Fisher folks, Fisher folks using um, e-wallet and um, subscribing to various financial services, right? So I, I experienced it myself. I went to the beach um, a few weeks ago and I didn't have cash and some some Fisher folks went by and they were trying to sell me their day's cash. Um, and I said, I don't have cash. And then they said, oh, ma'am, but we have Gcash. So I ended up buying their all of their cash. And suddenly, you know, uh, opportunities are opened up because of that. 
We even have like even wet market stall vendors using it, um, tricycle drivers or, or the ones that are uh, are using the motorcycles for for their livelihood. All these um, supposedly unbanked or unsophisticated in terms of their financial um, services behaviors are now involved. So the the financial inclusion as a vision um, is slowly becoming a reality. So that's what's um, really inspiring us to do even more and to innovate even more. Yeah, the, the reach is really fascinating. Um, let me turn to Dax. I, I want to hear the HSBC view as, as these wallets, usage of wallets are proliferating. They're adding new users. They're adding new services like credit, insurance, um, you know, without branches, right? How does HSBC view this, this new world? So the the world is always moving and there's there are always trends, but we as HSBC are in business because of our customers and our clients. So that is very, very um, dear to us and, and, and at the centre of everything we do. And every day we try and improve on what we can do for our customers and really learn from that. So we have a very profound corporate social responsibility in terms of access um, to our payment infrastructure and access to everybody. We have a corporate social responsibility about um, enabling um, families and, and everybody to learn about financial responsibility early on. So from our initiatives in schools to locally, we are very, very focused on that. So that is our foundation ground. And yes, absolutely, we take that seriously. We are also very focused on digitization. So where we can enable payments and enable them to um, work straight through, um, to be able to um, work across the globe and to be able to introduce the right technologies, we are very, very focused on that as well. But it it, it is very much a balance between the two. Um, and it's, it's important to remember, you know, nobody, nobody, wakes up in the day and thinks the reason I'm waking up today is to make a payment. Everybody is living their everyday um, lives. So really for us, it's about being seamless in the background, but also um, as um, everybody understands the payment space more and more, it's about that simplification. And in today's world, you know, we have with so many choices um, in terms of how we transact, where we transact, how does that all work? Um, you know, the more we focus on that simplification and the ability and the ease um, around all of that, that is really, um, you know, a key integration focus as well. But we are very, very balanced because, um, you know, what we do um, impacts people across the world and around the world. And we're very keen to make sure that accessibility is there. And, and we deliberately um, have initiatives that support that um, in balance. So, as I say, a very keen um, social um, piece with which we're driving on equally um, a very centered digitization piece um, that is getting more exciting by the minute. And so education, inclusion, um, delivering within the community is what people need, right? In a simple way through technology um, sounds like sounds like the answer. Um, and Salvador, let me ask you, you know, Visa being sort of this neutral party in between all of this, right? Visa wants to be the enabler behind the scenes, no matter whether a payment is moving through a traditional banking um, uh, system or through a wallet or, um, or via, via crypto exchanges. Um, what is Visa's view here um, on the shift away from cash? All good, right? But how do you maintain that, um, that neutral positioning um, within um, all of these different ecosystems players? The need to displace cash is very significant for everyone. And I don't think that uh, even with the pandemic, as Jan was mentioning, cash is necessarily decreasing. So I think the pie is big enough to really have many solutions and, and, and many ways to, to support consumers and merchants displacing that. Our focus is still enabling the small and medium-sized businesses. Um, uh, according to our estimates, we have just in, in, in our uh, SEMIA region 60 million small merchants that are not accepting digital payments. So the gap is still very significant. If we look at, at a country like Russia, which has advanced significantly in the past few years, the official figure from the central bank is 70% of retail transactions are digital. There's still a 30% cash. So what Visa is doing is really working with all the partners. We have always been an open loop. We uh, uh, offer our rails 
to uh, our traditional uh, clients, primarily financial institutions. But right now we have a, a broader scope of partners we are working with. And that's part of the, the strategy that, that we have. I would like also to add, um, going to, to the point made before on how seamless the payment experience has to be for, for consumers. We are seeing very interesting trends also in terms of development of new uh, payment ecosystems, which is not only the payments experiences, uh, social uh, networking is e-commerce. It's a mix of traditional players with emerging players. And uh, we need to be part of that e equation. I think the payments arena is, uh, needs to be scalable, interoperable, and global reach. And those are the key attributes for a company like Visa to continue uh, with this uh, mission to ensure everybody is, is enabled to, to digitally transact. Yeah. Um, so, so we heard a lot um, about all the opportunities, all the great things that digital payments can bring. Um, I want to hear a little bit about the challenges. You know, what are some of the challenges, some of the risks um, as we move into this increasingly digital environment? Um, you know, with with crypto, it's around um, around uh, security, custody, um, volatility. Um, we have uh, fraud issues with with cards. Um, we have infrastructure challenges with the technology generally. Um, you know, acting locally, acting globally. Um, who wants to take a shot at the the challenges that you're facing? Um, maybe do you want to start with Jan? Yeah, I can I can just offer a couple of thoughts. Um, so first of all, I feel that uh, the pandemic put us at a tipping point and uh, people will want to hold money wherever they feel comfortable. You know, we need to understand that some people don't like bank accounts. Some people prefer e-wallets. So that's kind of one side of the aspect and that's where the store of value happens. On the other hand, it's really the 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 acquiring or enablement at the point of sale because especially for the micro businesses it's very difficult um, to you know transact digitally unless we bring the cost down so it's great that we all talk about uh, you know the fantastic visions we have how to do something but we have to understand that currently the cash the perception of cost of cash among many people is uh, close to zero Right. I know that there are some uh, risk associated with handling cash and all of that stuff. But uh, what we need to do as industry, in my opinion, we have to bring very attractive proposition to the to the merchants and especially micro and uh, very small merchants, which are driving many economies around the globe. And uh, we will not be able to harvest three percent, four percent, you know, acquiring uh, cost for for these transactions. It's just not going to happen. So I think that's kind of one aspect practically. The other thing is uh, we all love payments. We are payments uh, geeks and enthusiasts. We like to talk about payments. People don't want to think payments and that's Martha's point, right? We need to bring it in a layman's term, very easy to use solutions where people will not have to think about, uh, you know, how to pay. They can really focus only about the how much and uh, and it happens. And the other aspect which I wouldn't like to underestimate is the socioeconomic uh, situation today around the globe. I think we all believe that uh, the economy is becoming global, but we also see a lot of examples where the countries are trying to protect a little bit from the outside world. And then don't forget cash actually has a lot of um, uh, national symbols on it, right? People are actually proud using banknotes and carrying banknotes. And that's where I believe some of the cryptocurrencies may have a bit of a difficult time. Uh, and that's maybe the central bank movement into the central bank digital currency where ca they can bring some of these national aspect and actually have people being proud of using this new payment method or store their wealth there is going to be important. I, I'll stop there because there are many technical challenges. I'm also a techie, but I'll leave it to my fellow panelists. Great, great. Let's go to let's go to Martha on this one next. Um, so as we get into the digital world, especially in the Philippines, um, what we see is there are a lot of scammers out there. So no matter how secure our platform is, um, the challenge really is in educating people about um, safety measures, simple as not sharing their MPINs, um, uh, using biometrics instead of just the passwords. So um, and and scammers are being are being so creative now, um, and they they keep on just evolving and and with the hardships that we're feeling right now so people would really 
be very creative to find like ways of living, right? Um, the, the second one is um, ID, national ID. So in the Philippines, we don't have a national ID. Um, Gcash is the informal national ID now, uh, having 40 million subscribers in our in our system. But but um, it's still the, it's still best to have a national ID so we get to control and have one official identification for everyone. And as we get to the base of the pyramid, all the more this becomes important. So those are the two things that um, I think are the main challenges that we face. Thanks, Martha. Uh, Jeremy, what are you seeing in terms of challenges and, and risks on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, you know, I think um, the 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 challenge that that I'm seeing and, and thinking about is is maybe a little bit more macro, which is is really um, the the advent of, of of digital currency technology has has created a world where um, you know uh, effectively you know. Financial value and financial contracts can be um, ex can be exchanged and executed um, just instantly globally by anyone over the public internet. And so we now have a world where there's immediate global reach for money uh, that that is entirely peer to peer, whether between a person or an entity and a business um, that sh breaks all national borders and boundaries. Uh, where financial contracts, whether it be a lending arrangement or, a, or or some other more complex form of economic contract, can actually be implemented in code between entities on the internet. And this whole new kind of crypto economic system that's being built poses huge challenges. Um, it, it breaks the expectations that um, that you know financial ministries and central banks have about certain ways that money is governed. Um, you know, just like in the early days of the of the commercialization of the internet, uh, the idea that anyone could broadcast their opinion to any any other human on the planet without any intermediary was a pretty radical idea and made a lot of governments very very uncomfortable. Uh, they had you know very tight controls, national monopolies. They licensed who could actually make their opinion known or censored and and so on. But ultimately, like society. And, and commercial institutions sort of voted with their dollars and said, we actually prefer this open, connected, global infrastructure. It's just far superior for society and the economy. And so I think we're seeing that tension today, which is a, a radical breakthrough in the openness of the financial system and what that can mean for individuals and, and, and firms and governments really, really struggling to figure out how to, in their eyes, kind of put the genie back in the bottle. But the genie's not going back in the bottle. I think it's out and it's, it, it, is, it is doing its magic. Um, and so, it, but it creates real challenges because there are important risks. There's you know, financial crimes risks, there's fundamental financial, financial stability risks, um, that there, there are you know, you know, bounce of payment risks and, and various types of things that, that are important. Um, but I think that this sort of organic growth in public internet money um, is is irreversible, and so now it's just really I think ha having you know ha having the uh, existing kind of not just regulators but other institutions that interact with this um, learn how to adapt uh, to that new world. Yeah, you, you bring up a great point and a, and a really big question mark when we think about digital currencies and and that is regulation. Um, and you mentioned, you know, that the, the genie is out of the bottle, and I think that I think that's right when we see the amount of volumes that are out there and the market caps of some of the currencies. What do you think that regulators might do, though? What what is something that, that they can do um, to begin to get a little bit more um, of a grip on what's happening in the DeFi world? Yeah. I mean, it's still really early days in this. You know, a couple trillion dollars of of, of market cap is is still quite small. Um, when you think about, you know, for example, um, you know, kind of fractional reserve money, commercial bank electronic money is 130 trillion dollars of value today in, in the global economic system. The financial assets as a whole, equity assets, debt assets, etc., about you know 350 trillion. So we're talking about about you know. Um, $500 trillion of value that exists in the legacy financial system. And so the numbers, again, are, are quite small. I think when you start getting into tens of trillions you know, and more, then the stakes get a little bit higher. Um, but I think there's, there's, a, there's an appropriate amount of attention from regulators on this. I think you know, you know, fundamental controls around identity and record keeping and, 
and and making sure that this you know the, this technology is, isn't abused by tax evaders or, or or criminals and 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 making that firmer. Um, you're seeing some uh, some jurisdictions take a harder line on um, you know green energy energy utilization of some of this technology. Uh, you know where some platforms have have a you know have the potential to be higher uh, higher usage in terms of CO2 emissions. Um, and um, you know th th there there are other dimensions to this because so much of this now kind of leads into the the world of securities and and what are securities and what are all these different token instruments and how to classify them. But um, I think I, I I'm you know I'm, I'm I tend to be optimistic um, just in general um, and I'm cautiously optimistic that you know the the sort of advancements that are happening from a private sector perspective and, and ultimately what what benefits can be brought to, to people and businesses will ultimately get reflected in in sound regulatory policy as well. Yeah. Yeah. Let me let's stick with this topic. Let me turn to Goldie and then we'll get back into the to the broader um, look at at risks with our other with our other speakers. Goldie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean maybe back to talking about risks. I, I think that the biggest risk we have right now is actually um, other humans that are taking advantage of, of people not really familiar with what's happening in, in the world of digital currencies. And, and you know what, what we're going through in this world right now of, of money digitization always reminds me of what happened in the telecom industry. That you know we've been having phone, making phone calls for about 70 years now, uh, probably a bit more. But uh, and the infrastructure has evolved over time, and now we can have a phone call, but we can also have a video call, and we can have emails on our phones because the infrastructure have changed. But in essence, we humans we still do the same things. And as that infrastructure, by the way, evolved, we had a lot of people taking advantage of that telecom infrastructure. The most uh, I think known person was obviously Kevin Mitnick in the U.S. Right? That was uh, hacking uh, AT and T telecom. Uh, all over the place. But I think that as the infrastructure now is evolving in digital currencies, sure, there's a lot of risks in how to handle that uh, uh, safely and how people should store their money. But really, what what, what is what I think is the, the most dangerous uh, risk that regulators need to handle is is making sure that it's it's hard for other people, I guess, to to run scams around that. Like selling, uh, we see people sell selling DM, which is the Facebook-led cryptocurrency project, although it hasn't been released yet, right? And I've seen websites selling USDC. Well, it's not really USDC, the currency that Circle is after. So I I, I think this is where uh, this is part of uh, those um, small baby steps that that we're having while we're digitizing this world. And I think that you know, ten years from now. We won't even remember this. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me give. We're, we're, we're getting uh, getting low on time, but I want to give a, a chance um, to Dax and then Salvatore to answer the questions about the challenges and risks that are that are most prominent in your minds. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, I, I focus very much on regulation is absolutely key for us. Um, and the best uh, organizations globally um, self-regulate. So if you are doing the right thing anyway, every regulator is going to back you. And in terms of, you know, um, the key tenants of focus, um, if you look at, and this is agnostic of any payments technology, you know, whatever the technology, we are focused on our service. Our customers want to know that their payments are reliable and that their payments get through. Um, to some de degree, again, it's not about the payments mechanism. It's about knowing that if I want to pay you, I want to know that I've sent the payment and that you've received it safely and equally vice versa. So that's really, really key to us. Um, we're also um, clearly focused on the digitized world. And, and again, that comes um, from a place of safety and protection. So we are very focused on our cyber agenda. And that is something, again, that is at the heart for our customers and therefore uh, we are very diligent with that. Um, there's always on all of these agendas more work to do, but that is very much at the heart of what we focus on. And our third tenant, tenant in terms of our focus is really then about that education. So again, irrespective of um, you know the medium of uh, any payment, um, we have that responsibility to educate from a very, very young age um, the social responsibility and the personal responsibility about financial management. So this can become at a very young age, you know, with a 
with a mother and a, a, a child and explaining how that works and then being able to sort of build on that in small short steps um, it then leads to a lot more once you get more financial responsibility but we are great believers that you know what you do when you have a small amount of money that same ethos um, permeates through however much money then um, comes through the system so what we um, look to do is be the exemplar in terms of um, spreading that word across the globe. And uh, we look to um, raise that awareness um, across across all of the um, customer groups that we work with and their families. Really important, definitely. Um, I'm gonna give the last word to Salvador um, to share with us uh, the challenges on his plate or um, any other opportunities he wants to comment on. Thank you, Julie. I'm going to be very brief because I realize we run out of time, but I, I, I think it was already mentioned security, trust and confidence is key in payments. If we don't secure that, we won't succeed. And that's something that takes time and the uh, end user has to feel comfortable with it. And that's the number one priority for all of us who are in the payments industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd like to thank our esteemed panel. Um, this was a great discussion. I know I learned a lot. I hope you, our audience, really learned a lot um, and enjoyed the discussion and start using your, your digital payments more and more. Bye, everybody. <laughs>